My name is Ken Lynch and I'm Director of Marketing at Senate. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out of your day today to join our webinar titled Using Laura WAN to Automate Water Utility Data Collection and Deliver Contactless Smart City Solutions. Before we get started, I've got a few prep items to let you know about. By default, all participants are on mute. Uh, there is a chat box available um, on your, at the bottom of your screen to type any questions to the host. Uh, this should only be used if you need to communicate issues with your connection and we'll do the best that we can to support those. Uh, there's also a Q&A function uh, which allows you to submit questions. Uh, we'll be answering as many of these as we can during the webinar, uh, for, but for those that we don't get to, uh, we'll follow up as soon as possible after the uh, webinar is concluded. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted for future viewing. Uh, and we're also going to be emailing a link for the playback uh, of the webinar to all registrants. Now we'd like to introduce you to our speakers. Uh, today, you're gonna to be getting different perspectives and learning best practices from leading companies across the Laura Wayne eco excuse me, ecosystem. Uh, presenters for today's webinar are Remy DeMurl, Marketing Director for the Laura Ecosystem at Semtech. Andy Honeycutt, President and Chief Consulting Officer at Metersys, and Dave Jendel, CTO and COO at Senate. A quick review of today's agenda uh, before we get going. Uh, we're going to open up with an introduction to LoRa and LoRa WAN technologies, a market overview, and a review of the growing ecosystem of companies in the water metering, water management, and smart city um, markets. And this will be presented by uh, Semtech. This will be followed by a review of the requirements for designing and deploying LoRaWAN networks for large scale device deployments uh, and new engagement uh, models available to utilities and municipalities uh, presented by Senate. And lastly, presented by Metersys, a detailed look at the evolution of AMI, a municipal customer case study illustrating uh, the decision points and value driven by LoRaWAN solutions and the opportunity that municipalities have to leverage LoRaWAN connectivity beyond AMI uh, for a variety of smart city solutions. And with that, I think we're ready to get started and I will hand it over to Remy. Thank you very much, uh, Ken. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be invited um, as a uh, Semtech uh, for um, participating in this webinar. Um, we will discuss about the uh, LoRa uh, in terms of technology features. Also, uh, we will uh, cover the topics of uh, the market adoption. And uh, we will also um, give uh, more insights about uh, uh, what is going on in this uh, low power wide area network uh, that uh, may be uh, new for some people, but I will explain uh, more in details. Um, so the, the benefit of um, uh, LoRa is today to be a radio technology uh, that has been acquired by Semtech uh, in 2012 and that is used uh, today by a million of uh, devices over the world uh, with um, the available free license uh, spectrum. In the uh, US, it's uh, 915 megahertz. And uh, for, I would say, uh, what has been changed compared to um, uh, some decade ago where, where developed first uh, RF uh, and uh, other protocols for connecting uh, meters, um, we have today the capability to have very long range and to cover with one uh, antenna, one so-called gateway, a very large area, uh, more than uh, 20 miles coverage. It's uh, better than a cellular antenna. It allows also to have uh, penetration in buildings, but especially for the case of uh, metering, it allows you to connect meters that are installed um, in deep underground and uh, 60, 90 centimeter deep in water pits that sometimes can be covered with um, a metal plate and uh, makes it more difficult for radio to penetrate. The LoRa also uh, allows you to have uh, a very good consumption, a very good uh, um, power trade-off for long range. LoRa simply means long range, but it also has low power. And that's why today LoRa 
is um, a key technology from the low power wide area network. The lifetime of uh, the water meter is a, critic, a criteria of importance. Water utilities uh, today in North America require 20 years. In Europe, it's likely more in the 15 to 16 years. But uh, with that technology um, that consumes very less power, you can achieve on a daily basis two, three transmission a day and still remain for 20 years, which is a very good uh, trade-off uh, for, I would say, uh, the, the long range, the deep penetration and uh, the lifetime. That's uh, the key criteria for choice of the technology. But there are other benefits uh, like the capacity, with uh, one antenna, you can have millions of messages per day on a 24 hours basis. And then uh, you can have uh, uh, eventually a scale up of uh, this capacity by simply adding new gateways. That's a, a benefit also of the technology. An affordable gateway is in the range of $1,500 to $2,000. Uh, dollar and uh, that's uh, for a macro outdoor gateway. Uh, there are also other range of devices and gateways for indoor for also a, a shorter range if necessary to adapt in buildings. But here for the purpose of metering, that's a very affordable infrastructure. Even more, you can have public slash private slash combination of both and the Senate will explain very well how this can be enabled. So affordable, open protocol, easy to use, and for an affordable cost. The other benefits that we have in the technology are the bidirectionality. Oh, sorry, I was quick. Yeah. Bidirectionality allows you to, for example, to control a smart valve or to um, uh, ask uh, for the credit of a prepaid water meter in some countries, that's important. So um, it's a protocol that where you can have uplinks, downlinks at the difference of Sigfox, for example, which is another LP1 technology where the number of downlinks is limited. It allows also to have um, a good interoperability. Why? Because the LoRa1 protocol, which is uh, the network protocol above LoRa radio, and specified by the LoRa Alliance is something that is shared by more than 500 enterprises and ensure interoperability with one unique certification. Security are also very important for IoT and um, here with LoRa One, you have two layers, two network keys, uh, two, uh, sorry, two keys, one network key and one application key that ensure all the content uh, it remains safe and protected. It can be transported by any operator, but only the payload content will be decoded by the application level. Last but not least, a geolocation without GPS is possible with LoRaWAN network, which can be interesting for, for example, for an inventory of assets, even if it's fixed devices like a smart meters. So the, the view of the stack explains the difference between LoRa and LoRa1. LoRa is technology of Semtech. It's also multi-source uh, supply. The multi-suppliers exist for LoRa devices, LoRa modules. And uh, you have LoRa1, which is an open protocol, again, specified by the LoRa Alliance. You have three classes of devices. The class A is good for smart meters. They can emit when they need a planks and remain open for two reception windows. Rest of the time, they are in sleep mode. They consume much less power. Class B, they are more frequent to wake up. And class C, they remain continuous. This can be used for class C, for example, for street lighting, when you, have a, when you need a good network latency to switch on or switch off. Yeah, but adoption, about the adoption of LoRa, 
uh, it's important to compare with other uh, networks and network technologies such as uh, uh, the NBAUT, NTM for cellular or Sigfox. Uh, by far, we will see that in comparison from analysts. But um, the number that we can share today from Semtech is more than 800,000 LoRa based gateways have been um, used uh, and connected over the world by the end of 2020. That's uh, the prognosis. And uh, we have more than 145 million of connected devices, which is by far much higher compared to, to Sigfox numbers or in BUT and LTM. In terms of countries, a recent study of IoT analytics said that uh, for NBOT, there was at the end of 2019, 92 NBOT networks and 35 LTM networks. So that's much less compared to lower one. The, I would say, analyst here make a comparison between the technology and predict a large, I would say, uh, for the next five years, a large success of uh, LoRa and LoRa-based uh, devices to represent much uh, the highest part of the LP1 connections. This uh, we should grow between 2020 and 2025 in terms of total installed base. Asia Pacific is the leading region with more than about 60%. And uh, this should, uh, expected, should be expected to maintain. But North America, Europe are accelerating very fast. Utilities is definitely the largest market segment for LP1. Uh, the analyst than uh, OMDIA, formerly IHS, account for 35 to 39% of the LP1 installed base. Gas and water metering are the leading use case. Now we will see with CNET the different application that can be used with the LoRaWAN networks. But before, just to represent the large ecosystem, you have for the utilities a very good, I would say, view of different devices from different companies. For smart metering, you have water meters from Neptune, Muller available in US plus Zener, Arad, and gas meters from IUD, Cold Card, also uh, from uh, Mesura. Electricity meters from Vision Metering are also available in the market. You have several other devices that can be used for retrofit or for also ancillary products such as gas or water leak detectors. You have also pressure, temperature, and uh, soil moisture, water quality control that can be made by different companies for LoRaWAN. For smart city, numerous players exist from uh, air control with Decent Lab or Metos from Pessel, street lighting with Flashnet and Bikia and Wellness, also Rodden Trap, KST, and Woodstream can support the applications like that. But one of the most successful applications is smart parking management that can be enabled by PNI. And now all these devices have been also in the catalog of CNET and um, can be connected with their network. Dave, the floor is yours. Um, as, uh, as Remy said, Senate is a uh, LoRaWAN core network platform and uh, network operator in the United States. Uh, we've been part of the LoRa Alliance since its founding um, and deployed uh, one of the very first public LoRaWAN networks in the world, slightly before the founding of the LoRa Alliance. Um, my name is Dave Schendel. I'm the CTO of Senate, uh, also a board member of the LoRa Alliance and the chair of the Regional Parameters Working Group for the LoRa Alliance. And uh, Senate's vision in this space um, has it's been consistent over the uh, over the, 
the many years now, the several years that we've been uh, working through this, uh, to bring uh, whatever tools are necessary in order to enable the really exciting uh, solutions that low power wide area IoT uh, bring into the market. So key to that is the core technology and the core protocols that, that Remy just mentioned. So from an operator's perspective, when we looked at these technologies in 2014, and there were various ones that were starting to compete at the time, there are a few things that really were very important for us in making that decision. And I think those have stood the, st the test of time and represent the key attributes of the technology that make it so attractive and so valuable as we look at solving these very interesting IoT solutions. So certainly, the open standards-based communications protocol is absolutely foundational to being successful in the market. And really, Laura Wynn, compared to many of the other unlicensed solutions that were uh, poking up their heads in the 2014 timeframe, really took a leading uh, stance uh, around that. And that open standard enables the networks that we build that support or when to support a huge range of devices and solutions that are out there. By the device becoming uh, compliant with the LoRaWAN protocol, they can rest assured that they'll be able to operate with any of those uh, hundreds of, of LoRaWAN networks that are being deployed uh, around the world. And that is very, very valuable to us as well, because as we're looking to take advantage of the networks that we deploy, we want to support all comers. Of course, those networks need to be cost effective. Of course, they need to be secure, and the LoRaWAN protocol is really instrumental instrumental in that. Um, the networks that we build are focused on carrier grade capabilities. So they need to be resilient. Um, they need to be able to support the kinds of applications that support critical infrastructure like meters, uh, metering and other utility applications as well as smart city applications. And of course, from a Senate perspective, we saw the opportunity here to bring this to the market in a cloud platform. Uh, LoRaWAN technology itself is most well suited for a centralized management and control plane. Its data plane is also centralized. So cloud deployment is one of the most obvious ways to take advantage of that and the scalability to support hundreds of millions and billions of devices as they get, as they get rolled out. And Ken, can you advance my slide, please? <clears throat> so when Senate looks at the opportunities for network design um, and design for utility, uh, utility and municipal networks, um, there's really a, a three-step process that we go through. We're going to go over that very, very quickly here. Um, how we design that, uh, that process, how we design those networks, uh, how we look at bringing additional applications and solutions onto those networks once that is there, and then how we follow that up with possibly densifying those networks as it's required as the solution scale grows. One of the things that's very interesting and important about LoRaWAN compared to many of the other technologies out there is that you can transition the way that networks are designed from a coverage model, which is how you start out to get the most coverage possible, to a capacity driven model so that you can continually increase the capacity of the of the uh, deployments underneath those networks the design and build process has four major steps um, Certainly we start with the design. This takes inputs from our uh, metering utility customers around the uh, locations, the service locations that they're providing uh, service to their customers at, as well as any potential assets that can be leveraged to deploy network on top of. When Senate looks at these problems, we really look at it um, both from the ability to take advantage of traditional commercial assets. So think uh, uh, radio towers, uh, billboards, rooftops, as well as the natural advantage that the utility or municipality can bring to bear um, by leveraging their own assets for a lower cost of deployment and operation. So we combine all of that, imp uh, all of those inputs together and we run through um, a design process. That design process then iterates into what we call acquisition and acquisition is the formalization of the leases, the rights of access, uh, zoning and, and building permits and those sorts of things. And of course, then the next step is actual construction. Once construction is complete, then we move to the verification phase to make sure that the network is going to meet the needs of the applications that are being going, going to be deployed underneath it. So this process um, is you know, fairly typical for uh, commercial grade, carrier grade networks that are deployed out there. But for IoT, um, it's very important to realize that this level of diligence is very important when you're looking to meet the strict and stringent requirements of utility and smart city solutions. So 
once the network has been deployed and once the initial uh, utility solution in this case has been uh, deployed underneath that, now we look at how do we bring additional applications beyond that first application. And really we are gonna break this down into two parts. Um, uh, and Andy from Metersys will go through this in much more detail, but we look at the uh, secondary and tertiary solutions that are still focused on the utility. Um, so this may be additional metering applications. So if you start with ga gas moving to water or water moving to gas, um, but also the additional applications that many of those utilities can bring on top of the networks that maybe don't have quite the same scale as the meter, uh, the metering deployment itself. And this could be infrastructure monitoring. So you can imagine uh, wastewater management, groundwater monitoring, leak detection in the mains. Um, you can also imagine even in uh, electric uh, grid utility applications so monitoring line breaks, monitoring pole health or transformer health. All of these are fantastic WAN applications that can be delivered on top of the very same network that was built to uh, serve that initial utility application. And it's really the capacity that's available in the LoRaWAN uh, uh, network that enables that. So when we do a deployment for a utility a metering application, which is a very, very dense application, we're typically consuming only one or two or three percent of the total capacity of that network when that is completely rolled out. So there's a huge amount of opportunity to bring additional applications there. And then, of course, um, slightly different sales motion, but very, very uh, interesting as well are the smart city applications. And those smart city applications range from everything from street lighting to, as Remy said, smart parking and, and pest management, to waste management, uh, on and on. And these are very interesting applications. Not all of them have the same scale as the utility metering does, but all of them are very, very uh, important and in in interesting to the municipality in terms of delivering additional value uh, to their constituents. Finally, once those additional applications have been deployed, <clears throat> we have the opportunity now to densify the network. And as I mentioned, we can do this really um, uh, in two ways, one to, to, to provide coverage and the other one is to provide capacity. Um, so we look here at a, a brief example. This is uh, Washington DC and three steps that we would take. The first starts with a downtown, potentially like a downtown uh, city area, if you will. This is uh, the, the, the Washington Metro on the left-hand side there enough density to provide metering in that solution. We then expand that to the uh, entire cellular market area around that. So all of the towns, the feeder towns, the suburbs that bring into it, and finally densify that as utility metering and smart city applications start to be delivered against those. Uh, again, this progression is very, very natural, and it's what Senate believes is the most uh, reasonable way to providing network coverage and growing network coverage um, as we're bringing solutions uh, to market together with our partners. Slide, please. So, of course, once we've gone through that process, we have to make sure that the networks um, perform uh, to the requirements that have been specified. And that's what Senate's core platform is engineered to do. Um, our core platform, again, cloud delivered, really focuses on three key areas. So application and end device onboarding and performance monitoring. So this is what the metering customer, for example, the infrastructure monitoring customer would see. Um, that's how they bring their devices to the platform, how they activate them, how they get data streamed to the right uh, backend endpoints for ultimate value data delivery to their end customers, um, as well as identifying potential issues that are going on within the, the population of devices that they have. So one of the things that's very challenging in the massive scale IoT space is how do you carefully balance understanding where issues are that need to be actioned when you have hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of devices that are all out there in the field. And that's a key focus of our solution. Of course, the complement to that is on the network planning and performance monitoring side. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about why these tools are so important, not just to Senate, but to our partners as well. Uh, of course, this is uh, related to how do you do ongoing uh, management of that network? So identifying sources of interference, potential capacity uh, challenges, making sure that the backhaul is, is performing reliably, and that you're delivering the connectivity that's required for the use case in the field. And then finally, as part of our business as a cloud platform provider, it's monitoring the core cloud platform, of course. So doing all of those things as in our DevOps and network operations teams. These things are all delivered through, of course, visual tools, but, of, uh, but also proactive triggered alarms that can be used to identify those devices and initiate very rapid response. So 
as we look at the specifics of the kinds of networks and the opportunities there are there with utilities and municipalities, one of Senate's uh, foundational beliefs is, is that you need a set of flexible business models and of course technical tools behind that in order to meet those needs. So one of the key elements here um, is the ability to slide between the different kinds of networks that may be uh, needed to deploy be deployed in order to support those use cases. Of course, Senate as a, as a public network operator, we primarily focus on public networks. So those are available to any of our customers that would look to take advantage of the networks that we're building around the country, um, as well as the public networks that our partners are building. And our partners are building those both from a pure infrastructure perspective, so they only build networks, as well as from an enterprise solution provider perspective. So they're providing solutions maybe for a hospital, putting out some indoor gateways to serve that need. And then those gateways take part in what Senate calls our LVN, our low power wide area virtual network that connects all those different pieces of coverage together into a unified whole. Um, so anyone is available to take advantage of that. However, in some cases, um, we do run into situations where uh, customers are asking for uh, truly private networks. Um, so a truly private network is, is much more in line with what the traditional uh, utility networks have been in the past where it's focused really just on that one use case. Um, so we can provide that capability where, for example, the, the utility or maybe it's the distributor who is responsible for deploying that site, managing that site for the utility um, or the municipality themselves, they can build out a network using our tools and platforms and keep that segmented in a walled garden for only their application. That is sometimes demanded from a regulatory uh, perspective with local rules and regulations. And sometimes it's just a preference or you know, historical uh, leftover from the way things have been done in the past. But what's really powerful and what Senate can offer is the ability to, to merge those and blend those together in what we call hybrid networks. So that hybrid network capability allows customers to take the requirements that they might have for building a walled garden and still have their devices leverage all of the public network uh, connectivity that may be deployed as well, or the, the, or the reverse, keep, um, take their, their uh, network that they've deployed and bring that into the LVN to support additional use cases for which they'll get uh, a revenue share from Senate, um, while keeping their devices segmented to the gateways that they've, been, they've deployed themselves. And of course, once they've made you know, any one of those decisions, they can adjust over time to fit one of the other models as it makes sense. Next slide, please. And this really forms the foundation of Senate's vision in the space for how we see, you know, LoRaWAN really being extremely successful here in the United States specifically, but around the world, and really focusing on this key uh, set of interesting uh, uh, opportunities uh, around the utility and municipality. And there's these two components that we've talked through um, uh, at length already. So first, the applications that we want to address. So certainly utility metering, utility infrastructure uh, solutions, smart city solutions of which smart lighting is, is a very interesting aspect, and those enterprise applications that I mentioned before. And building those, deploying those on top of a network that's built up of the natural advantages of all these different parties, whether that is the utility themselves deploying on uh, water towers, water tanks, uh, light poles, whether it's a municipality deploying those on municipal buildings, whether it's an actual network operator like Senate going in and providing a traditional carrier grade network on cell towers and rooftops, or whether we're partnering with tower companies who are doing that and bringing in those enterprises that have deployed uh, campus level solutions for hospitals, for higher education and various other things. So the combination of these two elements really builds a very, very um, effective and a very, very um, accessible network uh, for all of these different applications to come and be brought to bear. And from a Senate perspective, we really truly believe that one of the things that's been holding back smart city initiatives up till now in the IoT space has been the, the lack of this initial um, focus on the utility as the key use case to address first. Once that gets addressed and once those networks are able to be opened up to the smart city applications, then there's a whole host of low friction solutions that can be brought into, uh, brought into the market. And with that, I would like to uh, hand over to Andy Honeycutt from Metersys, who will dive into the details of uh, those utility and smart city uh, applications. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, Ken, Dave, I, I can't say enough about the, the uh, appreciation we have for Senate pulling this together. 
the conversations, the partnerships are critical in, in informing customers and, uh, and other partners about uh, applications. So we do appreciate that. Uh, certainly, we're excited to be a part of the team, you know, delivering eight, not only AMI solutions, but uh, coupling that with unlimited opportunities for smart city applications. There's no doubt that SimTech and Senate are great partners, and you're dedicated to working with us to successfully deploy customized and reliable solutions for our customers. You know, while our origin is, uh, is AMI, um, both on the proprietary and the open platform environment, uh, we really are considered an end-to-end -end solutions provider, so a service provider looking to solve problems. And, and what I mean by end-to-end -end is making sure that not only we do proper uh, configuration and requirements determination, but we procure, we select, we source, uh, and then we implement effectively with, with, with a high level of uh, performance uh, so that, that utilities get and agencies get uh, the most from their technology investments. So we're the systems integrator uh, and, and that partnership with Senate providing us that backbone for the network performance allows us to go into the field, get our hands dirty, work with clients in developing those end-to-end -end solutions and making sure that they've got a, a reliable uh, solution uh, uh, moving forward. We do provide turnkey support. So it is uh, uh, fully focused on being that partner and that solution provider we are focused exclusively in the deployment of devices, networks, and applications. So those are the three critical, critical areas of, of success. They have to work hand in hand, and uh, that's our focus each and every day. And then we apply our knowledgeable team that has experience and expertise in AMI and IoT solutions. We actually operate uh, through our metering as a service program, multiple uh, AMI systems. So we have uh, very deep knowledge in understanding the correlation and the importance of performance at the device network and application level. And then we're customer centric advocating on behalf of the clients. And so we, by being neutral to our partners and our solutions, uh, we're able to define that criteria that makes the most sense uh, for our customers. Okay. Uh, we have a, uh, one of our brands is Synthesis, which is the smart city focus for MeterSys, and that has evolved over time. Um, our experience uh, in the AMR, AMI market uh, spans almost a decade. What we saw in, in the early 2000s was performance challenges with AMR. We saw battery failures, we saw the electronics failures, first gen, second gen construction that really didn't uh, prove out and, and, and meet the test of time in terms of that harsh pit condition uh, Remy mentioned uh, during his, his conversation. And so a lot of change happened in that uh, mid-2000s. Mid, uh, uh, that would be 2014, 2015, when there was a new and refreshed look at uh, converting from drive-by reads to fixed base. And that uh, conversion really crossed over in 2014 and never looked back, as folks realized that, that as manufacturers got more sophisticated in design and more defensive against uh, water intrusion and, and protecting the battery health and the electronic health, uh, that became a reliable solution without really adding much by way of cost. Uh, we see in most projects uh, that, that the network itself and, and the associated applications only add about 15% to a meter replacement project. And so if we're looking at ways to, to be ahead of the curve in terms of technology, uh, what, without spending unnecessary and limited resources, we see AMI as creating that business case each and every time. Um, we saw um, in the latter part of this decade, the early stage projects using LoRaWAN enabled systems, manufacturers getting into network as a service, really taking away the network as a focus for why AMI makes sense or doesn't make sense, uh, but looking more at the end user uh, experience and, and how we can deliver that effect effectively. Uh, and, and then we're just really excited about the emergence of LoRaWAN and, and, and our partnership with Senate in being able to deliver an, deliver an open platform solution uh, for our customers that give them either the, the choice of proprietary networks or the ability to open source their networks for other applications. And this really engages uh, uh, the departments and, and the agency in a, a much different way. Uh, 
Ken, if you can advance the slide, please. So when we look at the, uh, the topology of the infrastructure, it's important to understand that uh, creating that environment that supports both IoT and, and uh, smart city applications is really no different than building a traditional fixed network uh, or proprietary system. There's sensors, there's network infrastructure, a head-end system, and end-user applications, and that's it. And so we're not really creating new topologies in which to learn and master. And while there are different unique uh, differences in how sensors are onboarded and what they require for sending data packets with transmission, the environment's really not a new frontier. And so we see that as the ability to design in a reliable and sustainable way. Next slide, please. So why are we excited about the intersection of AMI and IoT? Well, there's no question that AMI presents to utilities the opportunity to gain significant economies of scale in developing the comprehensive design. No longer relegated to just a utility and infrastructure project, we can now open up the concepts of automation to practically all operations within the organization on the backbone of, of AMI. Most utilities are considering a meter technology change uh, when they've reached the end uh, useful life of their meter infrastructure, or they, they've gone down a path where performance is no longer acceptable. And so we have strong economies of scale, we can model that, and we're doing analysis, consistent analysis now, to prove that out on the post build, uh, to, to affirm what the market says and, and is confident in believing that that ROI exists, and that it is truly an investment, not a, not a capital expense. Uh, we can improve revenues through read accuracy. We can virtually eliminate manual reading cost. We can standardize assets. We can conserve and provide conservation and environmental um, uh, initiatives that, that support um, more global uh, perspectives uh, for uh, uh, resource conservation uh, and, and carbon emissions, for example. So the network serves um, uh, serves lower WAN applications for more of a shared savings and benefits. And we'll talk about those benefits in detail in just a moment. Next slide, please. So the case study uh, is Sanford, North Carolina. And we're excited to be partnering with, with Sanford. They're, they're a perfect uh, opportunity to showcase the, the capabilities of technology. They're a full service small city uh, in central North Carolina. They operate a countywide water utility. They operate innovatively with a focus on customer service. So their interest in advanced metering, it began around 2008 uh, when they were researching cost and options. And then in around 2015, we conducted a feasibility study and presented those findings in 2016 on the ROI and the benefits to staff. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about what our findings were then. Um, but they really focused on competing for new industry, uh, new economic development with other communities. Uh, Research Triangle Park is, is, uh, is full of innovation and opportunity and economic growth, and, and Sanford wanted to be a, and wants to be a part of that. They want infrastructure investments that deliver uh, clear economies of scale, uh, not just about reading uh, meters. It needs to be more comprehensive than that. The goals in, should include effectively capturing data to make better infrastructure investment decisions. So what, what are we gonna do with the data? We don't want data for the sake of data. We want data that tells us a story or informs us to be uh, proactive in managing, uh, managing our infrastructure. Uh, and the city and utility management focused on customer satisfaction. So they wanted to engage the customer in a more enlight enlightened way. Uh, and they wanted to support those uh, customer interactions uh, from utility billing to environmental concern. The uh, 2016 metering and billing findings uh, gave us several indications that, that uh, change needed to occur and, and, and the city agreed. They had eight meter readers covering 258 square miles. I mentioned it's a countywide system. 1,000 read exceptions per month. That's where the read in the field and, and what should, should consistently be occurring in metering and on the billing side uh, did not align. They would send out 200 rereads per month. 375 disconnects per month. And then a, a multitude of tampers and customer turn-ons that never could be defended because we didn't have the data to make uh, defensive or, or, or regulatory or 
oversight uh, actions to, to prevent tampering and, and customer turnovers. And unfortunately, they had some safety incidents that, that resulted in water, uh, workers' compensation claims uh, while, while they were battling radio failures and, and poor broadcast performance from those, those transmitters. And then the staff time associated with uh, troubleshooting, uh, setting issues, and uh, radio performance that, that challenged the organization from a, from a, a staffing perspective. So the city wants actionable data. Uh, their, their focus is on, we want responsive quality data that creates for us operational advantages. And, and so that they can make more informed and timely decisions, whether it's diagnostic, predictive, or prescriptive. It needs to be easily configurable and accessible. Um, certainly they use a multitude of, of systems, so it needs to be compatible. It should eliminate data silos and engage the customer effectively. So for the IoT pilot for the city of Sanford, there were, uh, we have proposed and, and uh, it has been approved in the scope of work and we've implemented two water meter manufacturers that will be a part of the testing environment. Uh, we also look at parking sensors through PNI, uh, water pressure through Telog, uh, environmental sensors and remote disconnect uh, meter options for that, um, for that uh, initial phase and evaluation. We pull that data through uh, a custom dashboard. Uh, Synthesis has a device data management system that we use to pull in the PI data, not to mention the other sensor data, uh, in order to give the, the city a, a dashboard of sorts of options to, to, to configure and to report on, on performance, operations, and so forth. And then we utilize the meter data management system of both Mueller and, and Neptune uh, to present the read consumption data um, to the customer. Uh, all that is driven through network performance management uh, that Dave mentioned earlier on the Senate network application. And so it is a continued handshake uh, between uh, those, two, um, those two systems in order to maintain that data flow. Next slide, please. So the project objectives are clearly to deliver a LoRaWAN enabled network and serve multiple meter types and, and do that with 100% success. And we have done that. Uh, all meters in, deployed, um, and we used uh, propagation modeling to determine locations for uh, test installs. That's all working uh, very well. We want to use that network to serve the IoT devices, uh, and that includes the parking monitoring, environmental sensors, pressure, and we also want to take that data and align it with um, the read consumption data for a customer portal. We want to present the collected data through customized applications and MDMS applications and evaluate the actual performance of network and devices against the model performance. So we said and felt like it would achieve these performance goals. Did we meet that or did it play out in the field as it should? We want to prioritize the implementation strategy and we want to develop that CapEx OpEx forecast so that they can uh, understand what their investments will be for a full program build out. And last but not least, and the most critical uh, element of all actions uh, related to networking and device deployment is communicating effectively with internal and external device uh, audiences. So the key for uh, Sanford is ensuring performance. And that starts with the partnerships. I mentioned the Senate uh, and, and Semtech partnerships. There are a multitude of uh, global partners that, and, that are supporting a topology uh, for LoRaWAN that, that makes sense for our customer. We have to do a lot of planning in-house. Uh, we do testing in-house. We, we check for quality assurance, uh, interoperability, and end-user relevance. Uh, if, it do, if it's not relevant to the, to the customer, we need to identify it and take it off the planning um, forecast. We need to test effectively and develop those quality programs th through strict quality controls for not only device installation, but onboarding and managing those devices effectively. And then monitoring, managing performance through of the sensor in the network through uh, the applications. So the benefits are, are, um, are quite broad uh, and you see a list here. I won't go into each of these uh, elements, but, but we all can understand the, the importance of system modernization, expandability, uh, asset management, 
getting a great greater handle on your infrastructure, getting in front of your infrastructure through quality controls, being compliant, regulatory and otherwise, having a financial contribution. Uh, at the end of the day, we should achieve three, three things. We should improve our financial condition through efficiencies and, and revenue. We should improve operations um, and we should improve customer service. And if we hit those three things, we have, we've effectively achieved uh, what, what Meter says con con considers the, the, you know, the three primary goals of any, any infrastructure project uh, and do so safety and, and with, a, with a sustainable uh, forecast. So real quick, uh, we do have parking sensors that allow us and allow our customers capital planning and enforcement options that they do not have currently. As you know, the, the days of chalk tires uh, and uh, enforcement um, scans are, are hopefully uh, being more automated through uh, parking sensors and parking data. Uh, we get notifications uh, proactively for illegal parking, whether that be space-based or over time. And then it has community benefits. It informs drivers of what uh, uh, parking availability exists. And so they can achieve that, that uh, parking objective faster and arguably reduce carbon emissions. Water distribution controls has been a, a, a significant interest point in the market. We see that and we're, we're contacted quite often. Uh, to look at lower cost options to, to scale remote monitoring of, of water distribution, whether it be pumps, lift stations, wells, and, and critical collection and distribution equipment. Uh, it does not necessarily uh, replace SCADA as for infrastructure controls, but we do see it as that uh, alternative uh, for sensors and, and other, other monitoring uh, performance. It is simple and agile to de deploy and it, it provides a, the customer with more frequent and secure data updates to make better informed decisions about their distribution and collection systems. And then very topical is public safety. Uh, we're currently testing and, and deploying several devices that, that provide information on building and room occupancy monitoring uh, and even so fever detection. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, uh, our in current environment is going to be with us. Organizations are looking at how to work in the new norm uh, and utilizing technology to inform those decisions on whether it be occupancy uh, or risk. And so uh, uh, that is a developing um, program of work that we are involved in and, and certainly can share more. Uh, at the end of the day, there has to be value and it has to be our, be able to be articulated. Uh, it, AMI can serve as an anchor for enabling multiple, multiple LoRaWAN applications across utilities and city agencies. Uh, there's a business case. Uh, it is a, the backbone is, is quote unquote future proof, providing an expansive opportunity for utilities and in, 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 then into general operations. Um, it does require the, the partner topology to make it all work. This is not plug and play. Uh, and, um, and in that vein, it requires folks that are dedicated to outcomes and that have, have experienced those um, challenges with, with getting disparate devices all to work in synchronization with a net network and ultimately to an application. Uh, and that, that's through our partner network and we're all focused on meeting customized requirements that provide the greatest level of success. So at the end of the day, we're, we're extraordinarily proud uh, to be partnered with Simtex, Senate, uh, and other partners in the, in the ecosystem to create that value proposition that, again, has to be predictable, reliable, and sustainable. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to, to, uh, uh, to you. Great. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Remy and Dave, great uh, material, great presentations. Appreciate your contribution uh, to this conversation. Um, a number of questions have been submitted through the Q&A function. The majority of those have been answered uh, and recorded. So as part of the webinar distribution, uh, we will be um, sending that, uh, that Q&A uh, 
content out uh, to participants as well. Uh, there were a couple that uh, that weren't answered. Um, uh, a few of them were uh, around kind of the general advantages of LoRaWAN over other technologies. Um, so cellular was mentioned, uh, uh, Sigfox and other technologies. Um, so uh, Dave, maybe if you wanna take a first stab at that and then others can uh, can jump in as well. Yeah, sure, uh, Ken. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a, a few things that I'll, I'll comment on uh, that were part of the uh, part of that Q and A. So certainly, with respect to some of those other technologies that are out there, um, you know, we really see kind of two very important things with respect to the com uh, the comparison against Sigfox. So uh, one of them, when we made our decision in 2014, it was really around the openness of the ecosystem and the standards. But that's not present with the Sigfox solution. So um, that openness is what has created this fantastic ecosystem, and it's competitive. So you get you know fantastic price reductions over that period of time, and a huge diversity of, of solutions. On the technical side, there's some really important ones. So one of the ones I mentioned was that ability to move uh, from a coverage-based network to a capacity-based network. So we don't do that with Sigfox. And the capacity, that capability that we have within LoRaWAN is really about the dynamic control that we can uh, in place on the end devices with respect to their RF performance. So we can continually be tuning them, changing their behavior to take advantage of Better, uh, better RF conditions, denser networks that are being deployed, or to dial them back and get the best coverage possible uh, out of them. The other thing that's really important there, and again, Remy mentioned this uh, briefly, was the um, ability to uh, really have a, a fairly symmetrical uplink downlink communication with the end device. So again, that's not something that's possible with Sigfox. And then finally, and this really applies to both NB-IoT and Sigfox, um, is the ability to support mobile devices and devices that are moving at relatively high speeds. Thinking, you know, think about, you know, on vehicles, on trains, on even potentially on, on airplanes and things like that. Um, there's different reasons for that. So um, there's a, a, a modulation reason with respect to how LoRa modulation is different than ultra narrow band, which enables that um, in one case. And then in the other case, it's power efficiency. And the power efficiency uh, for LoRaWAN is able to be affected because of the unique architecture that it has, where all of the gateways are always participating in, in uh, and handling the, the traffic to and from uh, those end devices in the field. So as they're moving, they don't have to reestablish control of the network or renegotiate uh, connectivity with, a, uh, with one of those gateways. It's all done with that centralized core. Narrowband IoT, you can, in theory, uh, use those devices as they move from cell to cell, but it's a very inefficient process, and it becomes, in fact, less battery efficient than even LTE uh, CADM1 is uh, in those sorts of environments. So a couple of just really high-level uh, points on, on that point. Um, the other thing uh, with narrowband versus LoRaWAN is we still are very much more power efficient. So it depends upon the exact application, but it's usually, you know, between, I would say, four to ten times more power efficient than a typical narrowband IoT application is. Um, the other question that was that was briefly mentioned there, which is technical as well, which is how is all of this secured? Um, so there's two levels, uh, you know, multiple levels of security. Um, two that I'll focus on um, are really around the, the transport layer. So all messages that are delivered uh, via LoRaWAN are, uh, are secured. Um, they are all cryptographically signed. Um, and that the integrity of that message is validated by the network uh, itself. They are also um, encrypted. Uh, so those messages are decrypted at an application endpoint and at the end device uh, that we call the application server. And that's a component of the LoRaWAN architecture that can provide end-to-end -end privacy. In addition to that, when we start talking about how we interconnect the core network with the application, uh, providers um, with MeterSys, with the metering companies, then this is again another secure tunnel that gets created between those two endpoints, mutual secure tunnel. Um, and of course, then there are additional requirements as you start talking about the, the data, the meter reads, for example, that are being delivered to the end utility as well. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, we've got a question, a couple, uh, probably uh, room for a couple more questions here. Uh, we've got a question about uh, how participants can learn more about LoRaWAN if they're a developer um, or a business person looking for more reference use cases. We covered a fair amount of uh, smart city use cases here, but uh, maybe Remy, you can uh, jump in and uh, discuss some of the, the tools and, and uh, material available to folks. 
Yes, uh, um, I will provide uh, in the chat uh, some uh, web links uh, after that, but uh, um, for developers, um, definitely um, there is uh, a website um, hosted by Semtech, uh, laura-developers.semtech.com. Um, um, this contains a lot of material, also um, academy uh, training, uh, plus uh, a lot of tutorial uh, that can be very helpful, um, not only for um, developing uh, a new device, but also to understand uh, more about the technology, like the geolocation again. Um, and uh, for the business guys that are looking for uh, use cases, uh, the important stories, uh, where and uh, how many uh, devices have been deployed, uh, uh, for example, um, in France for water metering, uh, where we see um, a, a very acceler a big acceleration with Veolia deploying three million of water meters. All these use cases uh, can be found with the LoRa Alliance, lora-alliance.org. Um, there is also on YouTube several um, webinars uh, that uh, illustrate uh, in smart cities, uh, agriculture, smart buildings, etc. So uh, a good um, I will say a list of uh, web links that I will share with the chat. Last but not least, there is a next December uh, 3 and 4 in, of 2020 in Paris, uh, the first Laura One World Expo, two days of conferences and also a large number of exhibitors presenting innovations and uh, their different um, devices and solutions. Uh, don't miss out on this event. It will be a, a fantastic occasion to meet with uh, different partners and understand more on the real stories with Laura. Excellent, Remy, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dave and Andy for contributing to the Q&A as well. Uh, so we've reached uh, the hour of our scheduled program. Uh, again, we'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining. We had a great uh, uh, audience participation today. Uh, stay tuned for the recorded version of the webinar. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us directly in the meantime. Uh, thank you again and have a great day. <laughs>